Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and welcome to the well here at STSA. I don't have a joke to start off this week, because as you could see in the video, I was busy, busy, busy this past week with, you know, service stuff. But I do have a story. And the story goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a rich king, very rich king who lived in his big fancy palace, and his kingdom was very wealthy and full of peace and prosperity and all kinds of good stuff. The king had everything that he desired except one thing. He didn't have an heir. He didn't have a son. He fasted. He prayed. He cried out to God. And finally, after years and years and years of waiting, God answered his prayer, and a son was born to him. And the boy had everything given to him. The inheritance was all going to be his. He lived like a king already from a young age because he was his dad's prized possession. Everything that dad wanted was wrapped up in giving everything to this boy. The boy was the richest kid around. He had a rich future ready for him. One day, as this rich boy was a teenager, he went outside the city, uh, the palace walls, and he was walking around the city. And he found a little orphan boy. And something about the little orphan boy touched him. So he went to the little orphan boy and tried to help him. And the orphan boy said, no, I don't want anything. And he tried to give him money. The kid said, I don't want your money. Tried to give him food. The kid said, I don't want your food. Tried to offer him new clothes. The kid said, I don't want anything from you. You don't really care about me. You just want to make me your charity case. I don't need anything from you. Leave me alone. And he started to say bad things. He started to curse him, you and your dad, whatever it may be. And the boy had nothing but good intentions, but now he's gotten cursed out by this little orphan boy that he was trying to help. What do you do next if you're that prince? What comes next in the story? What's the logical thing that comes next in this story that he tried to help this boy, he tried to give him food, tried to give him clothes, tried to give him money, tried to give him help in any way, and the boy rejected him, the boy was rude to him, and the boy basically spit in his face. What's the next logical thing that happens? Well, let me tell you how the rest of the story goes. The next thing that happens is the prince does not give up. And he says, I'm going to help this boy one way or the other. So he takes the boy by the hand. And he goes to the royal doctor. And he says, doctor, I want you to do a surgery to make this boy look just like me. The doctor says, what? He says, I want you to do a surgery to make this boy look exactly like me. And the doctor says, but in order to do that, I need to make you look exactly like him. And the prince says, do it. And the doctor says, but in order to do that, it's going to cost you all your money, all your inheritance. You're going to have to give it all up to perform this surgery, because obviously it's a unique surgery. It doesn't actually exist, but you know what I'm trying to say. And the prince said, do it. And they did the surgery, and from that moment, that rich, wealthy prince now looked and lived like a poor beggar. And he got all that associated with that. He lived in the street. He got mistreated. He was hungry. He was rejected. And his life was there. While the orphan boy now all of a sudden lives in the palace. And no one could tell the difference. Obviously, it's a made-up story. Would anyone in their right mind do that? Like, there's some stories that are made up that you could, like, you know, based on a true story. Or one day you could see. But the story that I just told is ridiculous. There's no way in a million years that anybody would give up all of their riches to become poor so that a poor person could be rich. Like, at most, you'd say, okay, I'll give you, but I'm not going to take away from me to give to you. Like, you come and join me. And maybe you'd let that person get to here, here, here. But the likelihood that you would give them everything so they could get here, and then you would end up here, like, come on, Father Anthony. That's not a real story, is it? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you by his poverty might become rich. We're wrapping up a series here today called Irrational Generosity. And the reason why we're talking about generosity before Christmas is because generosity is the best word that you can use to describe what Christmas is all about. Christmas is all about a transaction that took place similar to my story right there, which seems like make-believe fairy tale, but that's a real transaction that took place. Actually, the real transaction is a much greater discrepancy than the, than the prince and the orphan. Our transaction that took place is our rich, glorious, eternal God became weak, sinful man. He took what is ours so that he could give us what is his. 
And that's what we talk about during this series, irrational generosity. We're not talking about giving. We're talking about generosity. And we talked about in the very beginning that you can give without being generous. All right? You can give without being generous. We're talking about generosity and a financial, but we talked about in our love, in our homes, in the way we think about people, in our judgments. We want to be generous people. Why? Because that's who our God is. He was a generous God. And the same way you saw in that story, that little boy did not deserve any generosity because the way he treated the prince. Well, I'll bring you another verse right here. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 and 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that he irrationally, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In this series, we're talking about what does it mean to live an irrationally generous life. The reason why we talk about irrational generosity, it's one of our core values here at STSA. And we believe, okay, maybe the screens will be generous with us here today. <laughs> we, there, see, look at that. <laughs> we believe that we follow an irrationally generous God who is irrationally generous with us, and we are called to live that same way. Again, not just financially, but in all of life. What we've been doing in the past two weeks is we've been looking at examples of real people who lived irrationally generous lives. We're kind of moving forward through history. We started with the Macedonian givers from the first century that St. Paul spoke about in 2 Corinthians in this chapter, chapter 8. They talked about these people who were in extreme poverty, severe tests, and they were not just giving, but they were doing what they were begging to give. They begged us earnestly that we would receive their gift. And you have these poor people who are saying, no, take our money. And St. Paul is saying, y'all need the money. They said, no, please don't deny us this opportunity. Please. Why? Because they understood that whatever they gave was nothing compared to what they would receive. They understood it was more blessed to give than to receive. Last week, we looked at the real Santa Claus, the man who inspired the potentially make the idea of, we always have kids when I talk about this subject, okay, who inspired the idea of Santa Claus. Okay, a, a, just cover the ears real quick. A tale so great, okay? And you say, the story of Santa Claus, this extraordinary tale. Well, I'm telling you that the story of Santa Claus, which is, is extraordinary, there's no way, it's a fat man who lives on the North Pole with little people who are a quarter his size, who flies around the globe in a single night with these eight reindeer, lands on top of everybody's roof and doesn't break the roof. He slides his fat butt down the chimney with all the gifts, then he somehow shoots himself back up that same chimney. A tale so wild, you say, this is ridiculous. And I say to you that there's a man whose life was so irrationally generous that he started that tale. That someone looked at him and created this tale based on that and said, you know what? Yes, this is fake, this is fake and this is make-believe, but it's not that far of a stretch. We saw the real St. Nicholas last week, and we saw how he really lived in irrational. We saw how people really can be irrationally generous in such extraordinary ways. And as remarkable as St. Nicholas was, and as remarkable as the Macedonian givers from the first week, we're moving forward in history, and we're going to fast forward to the 19th century, the 1800s, and we're going to look at somebody whose life may be even more remarkable than the first two. Not more remarkable in the sense that he did more. But in the sense that it's in the 19th century, so it's kind of modern. In a sense of, this is somebody who maybe your grandparents may have lived in his era, or your great-grandparents. So it's someone who's not so far removed from our context today. And that person not only gave to the poor, but he, like Jesus, became poor. He didn't just give to the poor. He himself lived as poor so that other people could live as rich. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about a saint called Saint Abram. Saint Abram, who lived in the 19th century. Let's start, first thing we need to learn about Saint Abram is how to pronounce his name. As you see, 50% of his name is A's. So that makes it very difficult to pronounce, okay? So if you are a skilled in linguistics, or you grew up, you know, in the Middle East, something like that, you say Abraham, okay? And you can add lots of ahs in there, okay? I'm going to make it easy for myself and my English speaking. I'm going to say Abram, okay? But for sure, there's two or three A's missing from there. But we're going to go Abram. Abram, which is a derivative, by the way, of Abraham. It's a derivative of it, but not exactly the same. Abram was born in the year 1829 in a village in Upper Egypt to poor relatively poor, modest family, very godly parents who raised him to fear God from a young age. And this was important because at a young age, his faith was tested. At the age of eight years old, his mother died. 
of a, uh, of, of a disease that is 100% curable, but they didn't have the means to cure it. Mom died at age eight, raised just by his dad. Thankfully, Abram didn't run from God in his, in his circumstance, in his trial, but he ran to God. And he found comfort in a life of contemplation, solitude, and prayer, which naturally led to him joining the monastery at age 19. A 19-year-old didn't want to party, didn't want to enjoy life. He wanted to join the monastery because he found comfort in prayer, and his, and his biographers say, especially in the prayers of the Psalms. As a monk, he dedicated his life to the life of contemplation, life of simplicity, and also to serving the poor. And at the beginning, it was just kind of one of the things that all the monks did, but he had a special affinity for it. You didn't start to see it, though, until he started to move up the ranks. After a few years in the monastery, he was asked, he received a promotion. He was asked to go to move from the monastery into the home, the residence of the bishop, and the residence of the bishop to be his secretary. This was a promotion that all the monks desired, because when you're in the house of the bishop, things stepped up a notch or two, like the meals were a little bit nicer, the accommodations were a little bit better, you had a little bit more high profile. Abram served faithfully as a secretary of the bishop for four years, and then of his own will, asked to be released from that duty to go back to the monastery, to live as poor, and to be amongst the rest of his brothers, the monks. Abram, as you see right there, is given the title the friend of the poor, because everywhere he went, starting in the house of the bishop, he opened the doors for the poor. Now I gotta pause the story right here so I can define the word poor. Because I say poor, and a lot of you have something in your mind of what a poor person is. Some people, unfortunately, think of a poor person as themselves. And what I would say is, we're never gonna admit that. But if that's truly how we think, we need to adjust our scale right here. Because there's a lot of people, I wanna say 99% of the people in this world will be glad to be sitting where you are today. So let's throw that one out and we're not even talking about ourselves as poor. We're not even talking about the people that we see in the street here today. Poor doesn't mean somebody who can't afford the new iPhone X. That's not poor. Poor in Abram's day meant somebody who owned a cow. And if that cow got sick and couldn't produce milk today, then that person didn't eat today and may not eat the rest of this week. That's what poor meant. Poor meant somebody who if, look, if it didn't rain enough, in the spring, or in the fall, whenever it's, or in the spring, if it didn't rain enough, then you might just not have any income for a year. And you just got to beg for a year. So that's why, you know, when we pray in our prayers for the rain and the wind and the sun and then the air and all that stuff, people really prayed for that because that was their life. And if it didn't rain this year, then they had no income. Poor meant people who when their mom or their brother or their sister or God forbid their child got sick, they watched them die of a perfectly curable disease because they had no means to do anything about it. That's what poor meant. And Abram, everywhere he went, reached out to the poor, gave the poor dignity, and gave the poor a home. I told you he was a, there was a secretary in the bishop's house. First thing he did is he made that house a refuge for the poor, even though it wasn't even his own house. But he would open up for the poor, and he would give to the poor. Eventually, he goes back to the monastery. After a few years in the monastery, he becomes the head of the monastery. And what is his agenda as the head of the monastery? All the monastery's resources, he gives to the poor. He gives to the poor. He invites them in. He gives them food. He gives them shelter. He gives them clothing. Eventually, to the point that the other monks complained. And the other monks said, hey, every time somebody gives a donation here, you're just giving it away. Like, we need to fix the stuff up here. We need food. Like, we need a lot of stuff. And the monks complained to the point that he was asked to leave the monastery. And Abram didn't complain, kept his mouth shut. He left the monastery. He walked in the desert, found another monastery, and said, hey, can I be one of the brothers right here? They gladly accepted him in there, and they welcomed him with open arms. And he resumed his prayer life. Eventually, he again works his way up the ranks. I don't mean it in like a corporate America kind of a way, but I mean that as you are praying as a monk, you are asked, he's faithful and least, is given more responsibility. So eventually he was asked to be a bishop. He was ordained as a bishop by the late, Pope Cyril V, and he was consecrated bishop over a city called Fayum and Giza. At his celebration event, at his celebration event, fancy schmancy dinner and officials, and there was a person there who was called the, I'm going to mispronounce this, Khedev of Egypt, meant the ruler of Egypt, okay, K-H-E, 
D, many E's, and then a V. Okay? That's the one I'm talking about right there. The Chalavari. Okay, that guy. And he was sitting right next to him. And as they're sitting at that fancy schmancy meal, and they're eating the stuff, Abram refused everything and ate only salad. And the uh, asked him, and he said, how can I eat all this fancy food when my brothers, the poor in the street, have nothing to eat? This was his way. He kept his, his bishop residence very simple, refused to, uh, uh, to decorate it or to make it ornate. He made it rather anything he received, he gave to the poor. One time, a rich person, many rich people would come and offer him gifts, and he refused them all. He said, give it to the poor. One rich person, seeing that his residence was beaten up and had tattered furniture and nothing fancy to talk about, instead of offering to buy him furniture, just bought the furniture for him so he can't refuse it. And they came one day to the monastery with nice furniture, and they moved it into the, into the bishop's residence. He politely said, thank you very much, didn't want to embarrass them. They told his servant, put it in the storage. A week later, a lady came to him asking for help. And she said, my daughter needs to get married. But we have all fallen on tough times. The way it was back in then is the way it was when you got married. The daughter was responsible to furnish the apartment. Okay, everything is like, everything is like deals. Okay, and those who grew up in that culture are smiling right now. Like that was, that was what you had to do. So you had to like, you know, the daughter has to provide the furniture and the guy just has to, I don't know, be the guy. Okay, like I don't know what he has to do. But so they were engaged fallen on hard times, and now they have to break off the engagement because they didn't have any furniture. She came to Abram. Abram brought the servant and said, take her to the storage and let her have whatever she wants. So here you see one example of a person who was poor. Abram was rich in furniture. And you see how he made the exchange, just like what Christ did. He became poor so she could become rich. Best story. I'll say one more story, and then we'll get on to our lesson. Once in his diocese, the churches all took up a collection to renovate the churches because the churches needed renovation and they needed improvement. They took up a collection. He's the bishop of the diocese. All the churches took a collection from their churches. They gave the money to the bishop. He gave it all away. He gave it all away to the poor. The churches complained. The pope called the bishop into his office. That's never a good sign when you get called into the pope's office. The Pope, I'm sorry, the bishop by this time, Bishop Abram, Abram, whatever, by uh, this time was an old man, and he had poor eyesight, and he was called into the office of the Pope, and at this time, it was a sunny day, and there was a window that had blinds, but there was one ray of light that was coming through, okay, one ray of light that was shining through the blinds, okay, that was beaming into the room. Abram came in, and he was older, poor eyesight. He walked in, and he took off his coat. And it was common at that time that houses or rooms would have a, like, a, a rope where they would hang their coats. Abram saw this beam of light, and he saw it as a rope. So he took his coat, and he put it on top of the beam of light. And the coat stayed there. And it just hung there. And the Pope looked at him. And everything the Pope was planning on saying to this man and reprimanding this man, he didn't say any of it. He himself gave him a donation and asked him to pray for him. <laughs> Abram spent 33 years as a bishop. Many miracles and signs, but that's not really our story here for today, so I'm going to skip over all that. The most important thing was he lived a life of intimacy with God that naturally poured out into service for the poor. Intimacy with God that naturally poured itself out into service for the poor. He died June 10, 1914, and in his funeral was more than 10,000 people who walked in a funeral procession, both Christians and Muslims alike. And many of them had a personal story to tell about the generosity of St. Abram and how it impacted their life. That's our story for today. What's our lesson? We only have one lesson today. We learned lots of lessons last week and the week before. I'm just going to go one lesson, and it's just one, and it's simple, but man, it's a big one, and we're going to need to unpack it. And that lesson is very simply this. Friend of the poor equals friend of Jesus. Friend of the poor equals friend of Jesus. Now, here's the most important thing I'm going to say here right today, so I need everyone to focus with me. The most important thing I say, I was about to say it right now, I'm going to say it right now. After that, you can go back to counting the lights and the lights, wooden ceiling, whatever it is. Okay? But listen carefully. Poor doesn't mean just money. 
When I say friend of the poor, I don't mean money. You can be poor in lots of other ways. You can be poor physically in terms of health, handicap, or having a difficult circumstance. You can be poor that way. You can be poor relationally, meaning that you have, you're lonely, and you're kind of shunned by society. You're kind of outcast. You can be poor emotionally, the broken, those who are, who are troubled. You can be poor spiritually, those who may be very rich materially, but spiritually were not raised in the fear of God or know anything at all about God, and they weren't taught any of the fun stuff that we get to learn here on a weekly basis. When I say poor, a better word for poor, but I just didn't want to use this word because I want to, I want, I want to, you'll see why. A better word may be weak. And a friend of the weak equals a friend of Jesus. Why do I say that? Example from Bible, example from life. Let's start with the Bible example. Why do I say friend of the poor, friend of the weak, equals friend of Jesus? Well, the passage is so clear. It's Matthew chapter 25. Jesus is speaking at the very end of his ministry. And he's talking about heaven and hell. And he's talking about the judgment day. And he gives the most direct, blunt expression or explanation of how the judgment day is going to work. So, so many times he speaks in like parables and mysteries. Here's no parable and mystery. Here's blunt, no interpretation, no commentary, blunt, straightforward. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. We're not interpreting this spiritually. We're reading this literally. He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of this world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was stranger, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the people are going to say, What's that, Jesus? We didn't visit you. We didn't even know you. What do you mean we fed you? What do you mean we gave you drink? What do you mean? Like, where did this happen? And Jesus says it right here in verse 40. Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. You found a weak person in prison, a poor person who was poor relationally and had nobody. You visited him, you visited me. You found a person who was spiritually poor and spiritually weak and knew nothing. And you helped him. And you were patient with him. You didn't judge him. You limitlessly accepted him. You did it to me. Abram built his life on this passage. And that's why he was such a great man of God. Let me give you an example from life. From, from a, a, a logical example. I have two kids. And any parent here who has two kids or more, you all understand this. This is very easy. This is logic. This is one plus one equals two. I love both of my kids equally. I love both of my kids equally. And I want you to love my kids as well. And I want you to help my kids. And I want to be there for my kids. But you know, if there's one of them who's weak in a certain area, you lean a little bit more in that direction. Not because you love him more. You love both. But if one of them is weak in a certain area, let's say both of my kids taking math. And one of them is struggling with math, and the other one is straight A's in math. And you come and say, I want to help Father Anthony. I want to help one of his kids. Which kid do I want you to help? Do I want you to help the, the, good, the one who's straight A? I'm happy that you do it. I appreciate that love. But I'd much rather you help the one who's weak. Because every parent leans a little bit to the one who's weak. Let's say I have two children, and one of them has tons of friends and is invited to every birthday party. Another one sits by himself at lunch. Which one do I want you to go sit next to at lunch? I want you to lean a little bit towards the one who's weak. And God is no different. Not that God loves the poor more than he loves the rich, but God, like any father, leans a little bit towards the one who's weak. There's a great verse from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 10, talking about the people of Israel when they were in the wilderness. It says, he found them in a desert land, in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled them 
He instructed them. He kept them as the apple of his eye. You know what the apple of your eye is? The apple of your eye, it's the white part. Is it the white part or the black part? It's a part of your eye. Okay. I think it's the black part, but it could be the white part. It's a part of your eye. You know when, like if a piece of dirt hit my hand, that's it. I might not even feel it. If it hits me in the head, if it comes near my eye, like you protect your eye, especially the apple, the white or the black part, you protect the apple of your eye, like you don't let anything near. Someone comes near and you, like the apple of your eye, you protect it at all costs. Did you know, ladies and gentlemen, did you know, this is a very important fact, that when you are weak, you are never closer to God than when you're weak. When you are poor, I and mean, I'm not just saying financially poor, when you are poor, you are never closer to God. Let me say it a better way. God is never closer to you than in your moments of poverty and weakness. And that's a great thought, and that's a topic for another time. But I'm going to take that same sentence, and I'm going to apply it this way. When your neighbor is poor, when your neighbor is weak, when your brother is confused, when your sister is lost, when your friend is lonely, when whoever is around you is in their moment of weakness, God is never closer to anybody in the world than he is to them at that moment in time. So you want to be close to God? You be close to the weak. You want to do something for Jesus? You find somebody who needs a little bit of leaning into, and you lean into them. We love everybody. We limitlessly accept everybody. But we limitlessly accept a little bit more of the weaker. We are there for anybody who needs anything, but we're a little bit more there for the guy who's in a situation of weakness and poverty, because that's who Jesus was. This past week, I was with, uh, we had a, a clergy meeting and a bishop was, was visiting us. And he was talking about, he was talking to us priests, he was talking to the Ten Commandments of Priesthood. One of the things he said, okay, like the sixth, ten, sixth of the commandments of priesthood was no partiality. A priest should never show partiality. A priest should never show partiality. That's what he said. He gave us the biblical verses. Priest should never show partiality. Church should never show partiality. Then number seven, you know what the seven rule was? Show partiality to the weak. That's exactly what he said. Rule number six, never show partiality. Rule number seven, show partiality to the weak. That if somebody is a little bit weaker, you cater to them a little bit more. And the strong, we bear with the scruples of the weak. That's what St. Paul says in Romans 15. And if there's some of us who say, you know what? We've been at church a million years. We know the Bible inside now. And, and here's somebody who doesn't know. And he's coming for his first day. We lean a little bit more towards this guy. Because that's what Jesus would have done. Look at the life of Jesus. When Jesus was passing through Jericho in Luke chapter 19, and there was crowds of people everywhere, who did Jesus who was Jesus drawn to? A short little guy up in a tree. His name was Zacchaeus. Who was too embarrassed to come stand down here because he was a short little guy and he was hated by everybody. And Jesus naturally looked through the crowds and found that guy. And he made a beeline to that guy. He said, hey Zacchaeus, today I'm hanging out with you. There was a thousand people who wanted Jesus' attention. And he showed partiality to the weak. In John chapter 4, when Jesus was passing on his way and he was traveling on his way into Galilee, he said he needed to go through Samaria. Why do you need to go through Samaria? Because I need to visit somebody. Who do you need to visit? You have multitudes of people in Galilee who want to see you. But there's a lady in a town called Sychar, a Samaritan lady. I need to visit her. Why do you need to visit her? Because she's the weakest person in the room. Jesus was naturally drawn to the weakest person in the room. His eyes naturally gravitated. Crowds of people bring me the children. What children? The ones we step on? Bring those to me. You are people screaming, but there's one lady who's bleeding. Where's that lady who's bleeding? She touched me. I'm here for her. He found the blind. He found the sick. He found the lepers. His eyes were naturally drawn to the weakest person in the room. And if we want to be Christ, then our eyes need to do the same thing. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says that Jesus didn't just give to the poor. Jesus became poor. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, insert poverty if you want, but was in all ways, in all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was born where? 
in a manger. Anybody know any king who was born in a manger? Anybody know any rich person born in a manger? Jesus, from the time he came on this earth to the time he left, was a peasant, was a poor person. He never had social class. He never had status. He was a carpenter, the son of a carpenter, low level. He lived in a city called Nazareth. Nazareth was like, I don't even want to say, anyone here from West Virginia? Okay. It would be the equivalent. I'm not saying anything, but I'm saying the way people look at it and people say it would be the equivalent. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious, okay? It's like the jokes were like, oh, you know, like, how many Nazarenes does it take? Like, that's the way it was. Okay, people made fun of Nazareth, and that's where Jesus was from. Jesus hungered. Jesus was lonely. Jesus was rejected. Do you know they called Jesus crazy at one point in time? You know who called him crazy? His own family. His own village. So this guy's crazy. They called him demon-possessed. And like, you tell me what poverty you've been through. And I'll tell you, Jesus went through it. Every poverty. And he accepted it all. Why? Why did he accept this poverty? This is very important. This is very important. Why did he accept this poverty? So that I, the poor, could be rich. Why did the rich become poor? So that the poor could become rich. James who calls himself the brother of Jesus. And we know when he says brother, okay, he doesn't mean like brother, like we know brother. The term brother back then meant either cousin or meant like half-brother. Okay, because Joseph, okay, who was the earthly father of Christ, Virgin Mary had no more children, but Joseph probably had many other children from previous marriages. Okay, Joseph was an old man. So James was either the cousin of Jesus or James was maybe like one of Joseph's other brothers. Anyway, the point is, James is somebody who knew Jesus well. That's my point. James is somebody who grew up in and around Jesus a lot. He spent a lot of time. He's probably there at Christmas, like hung out on Thanksgiving or Hanukkah or whatever he was back then. Okay, So he knew, he knew Jesus pretty well. And listen to what James says about how we should deal with the poor. James says in James chapter 2, verse 5, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. James rebukes them. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Can you imagine if Jesus came to this earth and said, You know what? I feel really bad for these poor people. I feel really bad for them. And did nothing else. Can you imagine if Jesus not even came to this earth, if God looked from heaven and says, I really love them. Let's, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let's hold hands and pray for them. That's what we do. We feel bad for the poor. We pray for the poor. We wish them all the best. And then we do nothing. Would it have been enough for Jesus to feel bad for us? Tell us that he feels sorry for us. Would have been enough for Jesus to do what we commonly do these days, which is my least favorite expression. Thoughts and prayers. You heard of this one? Thoughts and prayers. Okay. Something bad happens in the world. Thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers. And I thought to myself, what in the world do I want someone to think about me? Like if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm poor, I'm thinking about you. I want you to think about me. Like I'll take the prayer. I'll take a sandwich. You know what I mean? Thoughts and, th thoughts and prayers are our way of saying I'm going to do nothing. This past week, I spent time I go to this, uh, this weekly meeting of pastors in Arlington. And they meet every Wednesday morning. I don't go, I usually go every other Wednesday. And we all share together and we pray together and we pray for Arlington. And there's a certain pastor, his name is Pastor Dale, who serves at a church nearby. And they, you never heard of this church. All right, they're not famous, not nothing. The church is actually very unique. They serve the poorest of the poor. Their church... Here we have nice church, nice coffee, nice whatever. Where how many people? A couple hundred people. Their church is probably 15, 20 people. And every single one of those 15, 20 people is either sick, or when I say sick, meaning like really sick, or they are left by themselves, no family, no nothing, or they are a term that he was explaining to us, shut-ins. You know what shut-ins are? Shut-ins are people who have no family, have nobody to care about them. They're shut into their home. They live in a home, oftentimes a home that has no phone. And they're just up there in the apartment, 
and they get food however they get food. They have no work. They probably had a disability of some sort where they could no more work, and they're shut-ins. And his job, Dale, Pastor Dale, is to minister to these people. And he was explaining to us. He was saying he can spend an entire day to visit one person. Why? Because a shut-in, like I said, has no phone. You gotta find them, they have no address. They just live in that building and there's no mail, there's no nothing, you just gotta go and you just gotta find them. And if they're not there, you sit there and wait and then when they do come, they don't let you go. Cause you go visit a shut-in who hasn't seen a human being in a week, you spend an all day there, they won't let you go. And the ironic thing is that Pastor Dale, okay, I don't mean this in a, an insulting way, himself is not a healthy man, he's a very heavy set guy. And he like breathes very heavy as he walks. And I'm thinking to myself, Dale, how in the world do you do this? Dale was telling the story about how his ministry to the shut-ins, the nursing homes. He spends all his time in nursing homes, and he said no one wants to visit a nursing home. And if you've been in a nursing home and you visit the people who have no family there, you understand what he's talking about. Dale faithfully has been serving this community. I gotta tell you this. Dale, two years ago, he was telling us this story rejoiced and celebrated and thanked God because their church finished $40 in the black. In the black, for those who don't understand what it means, means their income for the entire year was $40. And they rejoiced and they thanked God that over the course of a year, not in a Sunday, like if we in this church, if our income on one Sunday was $40, we would, we call it an emergency meeting, oh my goodness, we cannot survive if our income is $40 in a week. They made it by the end of the year and had the generosity of the people and they made it $40 and they rejoiced. I told Dale, I pulled him aside afterward and said, Dale, you're my hero. You're my hero. You do stuff that I couldn't do. And you do stuff that if we're honest, none of us want to do. You know what Dale told me? Dale said, no, you're my hero. And he told me, he said some nice words about me. And why I tell that story is because I think Pastor Dale figured out something. Pa any person who lives a life of irrational generosity has figured out something that the rest of us are like, that doesn't make any sense, which is why it's irrational. And what they figured out is that any time you serve the poor, and again, a poor is not financially poor only, is that you gain a lot more than you lose. And I'm going to say it this way. When I serve the poor, I serve Christ in others, and I become Christ to others. How's that for you? When I serve the poor, and again, somebody who's lonely, somebody who's confused, somebody who is um, a shut-in, somebody who doesn't have someone to sit next, when you serve the poor, the weak, the guy who has nobody, you become a conduit in a divine transaction where Christ is the giver and the recipient. And you become the middleman. You become someone who's touching Christ over here and touching Christ over here. Because Christ said, whatever you do to the least of these my people, you did to me. So here's Christ. And we know that Christ is actually the one who's serving the poor through us. And we become Christ to others and we serve Christ in others. And Pastor Dale figured that out. That's why Pastor Dale said, you know what? Don't thank me. I'm good. I like my ministry. Because he realized that he has a chance to touch and be Christ for others. I want to wrap up with one verse. I, I hesitate to ever dumb down Christianity into a single verse. I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can say all of it comes down to like, this is the only verse that matters. I don't believe in that. But if there's one verse that would fit along these lines, I would go back to the brother of Jesus, half-brother, cousin of Jesus, in his first chapter of his epistle, the last verse. And he says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Why is this what Christianity is all about? Because this is who Jesus is all about. Remember the story I told you at the beginning of the rich king who switched place, or the prince 
who switched places with the orphan and said, you look like me and I'll look like you. And we said, ha, 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 that's ridiculous. That would never ever, like that's beyond ridiculous. I'm telling you that for a prince to become an orphan is nothing. As the eternal king who holds heaven and earth in the palm of his hands to come down and take the form of a sinful, slimy man born in a manger, lived in Nazareth, was rejected by men, despised by his own, left to die on a cross, naked, all by himself, people mocking him, jeering him, spit in his face, and say, ha, 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 we told you he was nothing. Like sometimes I think to myself, the physical pain, maybe I could take, but that emotional pain, there's no way I could take. There's no way I take someone, I'm a competitive guy, no one, I could take someone saying, ha, 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 you stink, you lose, I lose, I'll show you who lose. But Jesus did it. You know why? Because Christ is visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Do you know who the orphans and the widows are in this verse? It's me and it's you. I'm the orphan. I'm the orphan who needed a father. And Jesus came and said, I'll be away from my father so you can be connected to the father. Jesus said, Y'all are the ones. We are the ones in our trouble. We're the orphans. We're the widows. We're the ones who are disconnected. We're the ones who are isolated from God. So you know what? I'll come down. I'll be poor so you can be rich. And now he sends us out and says, you say you're my followers? Go and do the same. I'm going to bring our music team back up here because anytime we wrap up a series, we need to wrap up with a bang. I'm going to ask our music team to come back up here and as we conclude this series and we uh, prepare for Christmas, what were we, nine days away, eight days away from Christmas, a week away from Christmas, let us remember the irrational generosity of our Lord and our Savior. And let us remember how he gave up everything for us. And we worship him and we celebrate him and the gift that he gave to us, but then we go and do likewise. And you realize, you realize this is very important, you realize that today, and tomorrow, and every day for the rest of your life, that you find a poor person, a weak person, an outcast person, a shunned by society, a rejected, a lonely, a confused, anytime you find a person like that, you realize that you have a chance to serve Christ in them and to become Christ to them. And that's an opportunity that I want any one of us to miss. Let's stand together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your never-ending and infinite love for us, and your kindness and generosity, which manifests itself by sending your only begotten Son to this world to live as we are, so that we can live as you are. We thank you for that kindness and generosity, Lord, and I pray with all my heart that you would transform us from selfish self-centered, egotistical, all-about-me kind of lives and help us to live like you, truly being your disciples and your followers and living truly irrationally generous lives. And people would look at us like the way they looked at you and looked at your disciples and said, these people are not the same as the rest of us. There's something about them that's different. I pray, Lord, that we would be different in that way, that we would be irrationally generous and we would be characterized and known even if people don't agree with what we believe in but we would be accepted and embraced for our generosity and our love for one another and for every single person that we meet, even if we don't know who they are or their story or they're different than us. Give us, Lord, to truly be generous with our time, with our money, with our love, with our affection, with our hearts, with our homes, with our ears. Give us to truly be generous in everything we do. We pray, Lord, that, that you would inspire us, Lord, during this Christmas season, that you'd give to us like a, a, a new start with you, a new life with you, Lord, and that your generosity would bear fruit in our hearts. We pray these things in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, with the intercessions and prayers of all of your saints. Hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.